worship today. Father God, we thank you for your presence in this house. We thank you for the opportunity for everyone to come here today. Let your love, let your presence be known in this place, God. Let this be an open and welcome atmosphere. Let our hearts be open and receptive to what you have for us today, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. distractions, anything that's going on, Lord, let the people leave that outside, let them drop it at the altar, Heavenly Father, don't let them pick it up, Lord, let them feel your presence, Lord, let them feel your love, Heavenly Father, let them feel your power surging through their bodies right now, Lord, anything that's going on that's been going on this week that's burdening their minds, Lord, we just speak against any of that, Heavenly Father, and we just lift up this congregation to you, oh, thank you, Jesus.
to say something? We came up with this set with the intention of cultivating an atmosphere for you to be able to open up your heart completely to God. And not only that, but open up your heart with the expectation of receiving something from Him. And more specifically with the expectation of receiving love. sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it is not boastful, it is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, Prophecies will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We're going to take the next few songs and use this to open up the altar for anyone who can and is willing. You can come up here and worship and give your heart up to God, but let these songs be your prayer personal, personal time with Jesus.
Said of thanksgiving. Father, we praise you today. I praise you today for what you've already begun stirring in this place. I thank you, Father, for the stirring of yesterday, Father, the hunger of yesterday for today. I, I, I give you praise because of that desire, God, that I was that I was in yesterday, Father, for what you're going to do today. God, I give you praise, Father, that, that you are you are almighty God and you are pouring out your spirit on this place. And I give you praise today, Father, for what you're gonna continue to do, God, as I seek you. Personally, Father, as I press into your presence, God, as a corporate body, Father, as together we unified press into your glory. Father, as we hold on to you and we say, God, we not only do we need you, but we want you in our life, God. We, we 
we need you and we desire you, Father, to be in our lives, God, to give us wisdom and understanding, God, to bring leadership into our life, Father, that we would follow you. So, God, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for what you've been stirring in my heart. And, Father, what you're going to pour out in this house today, Father. Father, for every person that's in this building today, God, every person that hears your word, Father, through the, through the means of internet, television, computers, Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to speak into people's lives because your word will not fail you, God. It will truly do what you send it out to do. So, Father, right now I come against the attack of the birds that are stealing the, the seeds that are being planted. I come against crop failure in the name of Jesus. Today, Father, I speak over the ground in this place and in, over the ground that's in the hearts of every person that may be even possibly hearing this on playback. That, Father God, that our hearts are stirred. That, Father, the soil of our heart is turned and it's, it's ripe and it's ready, Father, to hear from you today. And, God, your word will produce mightily, Father, mightily, Father, overflow in superabundance in the name of Jesus. Expectation is a strong belief that something will happen. Y'all remember that? Expectation is a strong belief that something will happen. I'm just, I just show a hands real quick. How many people need something to happen in your life? Ooh, all the time. Well, that's a very vague statement, isn't it? Something. But I, I'm telling you, there's, there's always something in my life that I'm needing to happen. There's always something going on where I need something to happen. I'm just curious. Another show of hands. How many people? prefer to be <laughs> cursed instead of blessed. <laughs> Nobody wants to be cursed, right? No. Okay. How many people want to be blessed? Yeah. I want to be blessed. I prefer blessing instead of cursing. Yeah. Right. I, I prefer to be blessed instead of cursed. And so I'm going to share some scripture with you. And I, I'm really asking you, because when this subject comes up in, in, in most any ministry around the world, when this subject comes up, people tend to close off their ears. I didn't come for that. I come to be encouraged. But that's exactly what I want to do today. I want to encourage you today. I want to give you some information today. And I want you to leave here with some knowledge of the Word of God, not some religious expectation or some uh, something that maybe your, your daddy or your granddaddy or something somebody told you somewhere down the line and you're just doing what they said because they did it. I, I want you to have information and I want you to go home today and I want you to pray about what you hear today and say, God, how, how can you confirm that in my life? Can you reveal to me what pastor talked about today so that I am fully informed and I understand what he talked about? This is something that a lot of people don't want to hear. But if you turn in to Malachi in Malachi chapter 3 in verse 6 the Lord says I am the Lord and I do not change how many people know that we serve a God that does not change in his ways he does not change what he said he does not change where he stands now listen moms and dads grandmas and grandpas we have children we have grandchildren we waver in what we say. Now, look, we can act big and bold all we want to, but you know what? When when baby girl starts fluttering those little eyes at you and saying, Daddy, please, please, Daddy, please. Okay, just this once, don't tell your mama. <laughs> See, we waver. And mamas do the same thing. You know, when, when, when her little boy sticks that, that lip out, but mama, but mama, everybody else. Okay, look, don't tell your daddy. We do this. At some point in our lives, we have wavered somehow, some way. 
But God doesn't waver. He said, I am the Lord and I do not change. Now, I shared this verse of Scripture this past Wednesday night, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is inspired by God. That means that there were 40, over 40 different penmen of the Word of God, but one author, he spoke the Word into them and they put it down on paper for us to be able to understand understand and to grow and to follow him and to have this. But this right here, this specifically what I just read you in Malachi 3 is God himself speaking. He's not giving a subliminal message through the prophet. He's speaking for this is in quotations. He says, I am the Lord and I do not change. But in, in 2 Timothy 3, he says all scripture is inspired by God. What does it do? It tells us what is true. The Word of God tells us what is true. What else does it do? It tells us what is wrong. You know, there's some things that we do wrong. Would, would anybody agree that there's probably some things that we do wrong? I'm not saying that we're out to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to speak condemnation on anybody. I'm just saying, I think there's some things in our life that, that we do, like I was saying a moment ago, we do because mom and daddy did it. Uh, or maybe grandma and grandpa did it. And so we do it because they did it. Or listen, we don't do it because mom and daddy had a mindset, had a mindset of their own and says, uh-uh, we're not doing that. And so we're just doing it because that's what we learned. Right. And so, again, this is what I want you to hear today. I, I, I'm not trying to speak anything on anybody. I want you to go home today. I'm talking with a, a dump truck load. I want you to go out of here with a wheelbarrow full of information today that you can begin to pray about and you can begin to listen to God. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying through this message today. Amen? Yes. Amen. So the Word tells us in 2 Timothy 3 that it not only tells us what's true, tells us what's wrong, but it will correct us when we're wrong. Guess what? I've been wrong. I've been wrong in a lot of things in my life, and I am thankful for the Word of God that was spoken through men and women of God that instead of me closing my ears and saying, I'm not listening to that garbage, but I said, God, I want you to speak through your Holy Spirit and speak into me and reveal to me exactly what you want me to have. Yes, Not what preacher so-and-so or prophet ya ya or, you know, apostle flip-flop or whatever his name or her name is, but God, you speak through me or you speak to me through your Holy Spirit. And so that's what I'm desiring for you today. It will bring correction when we're wrong, and it will train us. And listen, he, he says it is useful. His Word is useful. Yes. Amen? Now listen, so would we agree that according to Malachi chapter 3, I'm just, this is just a poll, okay? This is just a poll. Malachi chapter 3, I am the Lord, and I do not change. Would we agree that God is solid in His Word, that He does not change? Yes. Amen? Okay, Hebrews chapter 3. 13 verse 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. Would we agree that Jesus does not change? Yes. Jesus has not changed, and Jesus will not change. So it kind of sounds to me like God the Father and God the Son are on the same page. Yes. God the Father reveals to us in His Word in Malachi chapter 6. This is Old Testament. Okay, this is in the OT. This is on the left hand side of your Bible for all those that follow the left. And then on the right hand side of the Bible, we've got the son that, that identifies that I'm not changing either. Right. Basically, he makes the same statement as his daddy. I am the Lord and I don't change. Jesus is his name. Christ is his messianic title. And he says, I am the same yesterday. I am the same today. And I will always be the same tomorrow. Amen. Period. There's no question about it. So why do we have so much trouble? Why do we go around saying, well, that's Old Testament? Now, you might not do that. Not everybody does that. 
But you would be surprised how many conversations I get into with people. Not arguments, just conversations. And they say, oh, brother, that's, that's Old Testament. That's, that's the law. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Well, praise God, I'm under grace too. But Jesus himself said, I didn't come to do away with the law. In fact, Jesus said, I came to fulfill it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled the law. Now he says the law is there as a standard to guide your life. He didn't say abolish it. He didn't say quit, quit reading it. He didn't say quit teaching it. And, you know, I... I I like giving you all the isms that Charles always said. And Charles always revealed that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. God didn't say do away with one or the other. But he said, if you will study the entire and totality of my word all the way from Genesis to the maps, you're going to see the full picture of who I am and how much I truly love you. You're not going to see all the, you're not going to see all of the condemnation and the killing and the, the hurt and the, everything that goes on when the children of Israel were rebelling against God in the wilderness. What you're going to see is, is God was, was proving some things in their life, proving for one that they needed him. And, and listen, we still need him today. Yes, sir. Amen. And so I just want you to, I just want you to understand that. I want you to see, I just want you to see what is taking place in his word. And I want you to see that God is not changing, not one bit, never has, never will. Amen. Amen. I heard a message uh, here just a few days ago. In fact, I, I, I listened to it again yesterday just to make sure that I heard everything right. So I didn't coin this. I, I, I follow a ministry. Uh, I, I follow Pastor Robert Morris, Gateway Church in, in, in Dallas, Texas. I follow his ministry. He's a phenomenal teacher, uh, just a, a mighty man of God. And I enjoy uh, receiving and gleaning from his teachings. And one of the things that he said is, is that um, he, he preached a message a while back called What Test? I don't, I don't know if anybody has ever heard the message, but it was a, a phenomenal phenomenal message and it, I could really relate to it because I'm one of those kind of students in my life like he was that would walk into a classroom and saw everybody with their textbooks open on their desk and I'm like hey guys what y'all doing and they're like didn't you know about the test and I'm like what test <laughs> Uh, anybody ever done that? I mean, I, I did that a lot. <laughs> I, I, I walked in classrooms all the time and said, what test? What are y'all talking about? We're having a test? <laughs> and, and you know what? But that's the thing is, is, is that there's testing in the Bible. Y'all know there's testing in the Bible? Yes. There's testing all through the Bible. And so right here, I'm, I'm going to jump back to Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, in verse 10, God says, try me now in this. Try me. The word try is bakon in the Hebrew, and it means to test or to prove. Listen, and this is the, the wording in the New King James. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching out of the New King Jimmy today, and he says here to try. It's like trying gold or silver. It's a proving process. It's like when they put gold or silver into a, into a kiln or a testing or a proving, it is to to prove its validity and to prove that it is exactly what it says it is. That it's not an imitation, but it is pure 100% gold or silver or whatever it is. And so that is, that is the word there. That word, try me, try me. He's saying, put me to the test. And listen, we need to hear this because listen, a lot of people, they already, I, I can already see it in some people's faces. They're like, I didn't come to hear about money. I didn't come. I didn't come for this kind of teaching today. But listen, this is the, this is the deal, y'all. God doesn't need your money. How many agree with that? God doesn't need your money. God does not, does not need your money. 
But if we were following a godly principle, then we would see here that God is not out to take our money, but God wants to bless us. I, I have taught from this passage of Scripture many, many times, and I have taught with, I have taught from it, not understanding or seeing what I'm teaching here now. Is the fact that God is not, he does, he's not trying to hold back on people, but he's saying, if you will put me to the test, then you are giving me an opportunity to bless you. Yes. So when the scripture says, will you rob God? He's not saying you're taking from my checkbook. <laughs> he's saying that you are robbing me of an opportunity to pour out blessings on you that there will not be room enough to receive it. Yes. This is a biblical principle of sowing and reaping. But it's more than that. It's a biblical principle of faith and trusting God. I've said this many times over the last several weeks. Is that we have no problem giving God certain areas of our life. We say, God, use my talents. God, I, you know, I have this, this musical a gift. Use it to, to glorify you. But leave this area of my life alone. I want control of that. Y you know what that means? He's not your Lord. I know that hurts. But listen, when we hold on, in other words, when we reserve control of one or more areas of our life, He's not our Lord. I, I'm sorry, I, I, but that's the case. Hey, listen, I can be a faithful giver. I, I can be faithful in trusting God with my finances, but if I don't let Him have my mind, He's not my Lord. He's a bank. Mm -hmm. That's all He is is I, I make deposits in the bank and I make withdrawals. Because when we trust Him, He says that He'll bless us. This is what He wants to do. And so I want you, again, I want you to see this in Scripture. You know what the number one argument, you know what the number one argument about, about tithing is? The number one argument about tithing is that it's not biblical. <laughs> You would be surprised how many people say tithing is not biblical. Oh, yeah, it's biblical. I, I understand. I believe that. I totally believe that. And I know most, most here believe that. But I don't, I, I mean, listen, and I, I've said this before. I don't know who tithes and who doesn't. I don't know who gives in this ministry except me and Tina. I know for a fact that we give. I know 100% for sure for we give because that's the first thing that we do when income comes in is we honor God. That's the very first thing we do. And we've done that for, for a, an extremely long time. For, for the majority of, of, of my walk with Christ, which, is, which began in 1995, the majority of that time we have honored God. And we have seen the blessings of God compound in our life. You know, you know and, and the thing is, is it's not that hard. It's really not. It's, it's a way easier than what people make it out to be. Because what happens is, is we get locked into a religious mindset or we get locked into some ideology that I can't. It's impossible. I just can't do it. And, and, I, and I pray that I can show you this today. But tithing is truly, it is truly biblical, but that is the number one argument. The number one argument in, in the church today is that, that it's not biblical, that tithing is in the Old Testament, and that tithing is under the law. Okay, I said this just a moment ago. Let's, let's see if we can't debunk that. But... Tithing is in the law, but I'm under grace. I'm not under the law, right? I mean, many people say that. They say, well, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Okay, well, doesn't the law mention stealing? Let me, let me just ask, is, is, is it okay to steal? No. no, it's not. What about murder? No. 
Well, but the law says thou shalt not murder. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. <laughs> so since I'm under grace, don't you think it's okay that I would do those things? Because I'm not under the law. <laughs> Isn't that idiotic? Doesn't that sound idiotic? <laughs> that I would have that mentality? That I would have the mentality that... That I'm under grace, and since I'm under grace, I'm not bound by the law. Murder, thievery, adultery, lying. I mean, all these things are under the law. So since I'm under grace, I get to do whatever I want. Not, not you're right. No, I mean, that, that, I mean, that is ridiculous. So let me show it to you. In Leviticus chapter 27, in verse 30, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, says all of the tithe, everything. Everything. That, okay, so uh, to put that in modern terms, all of the tithe, whether of the seed, of the land, or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy. Okay, so for the lack of all that wordiness, everything. Everything. And that means everything. The, the word tithe here, it means ten. The majority of people know that. The word tithe means ten. So there's something about ten all throughout the Scripture. All throughout the Scripture, the, 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 the number ten comes up all throughout Scripture. Think about the ten plagues of Egypt. Y'all heard about the ten plagues of Egypt? Yes. Right? And you know what a lot of people think? That those were curses that were released on Egypt. And, and those were curses. But, but think of this in, this in this setting. They were ten testings of Pharaoh's heart. Yes. Do you realize that? That God was testing Pharaoh's heart multiplied by ten, the ten plagues. The, the number ten pops up throughout Scripture, the ten commandments. In, in Revelation chapter 1, it talks about ten days of tribulation, ten days of trials or testing that will be taking place when he was talking to the seven churches. So there's just there's something significant about this testing and the number ten that are correlating together throughout Scripture. See, you can't just take one Scripture and say, oh, well, that's Old Testament, that doesn't apply to me. No, listen, the entire Word of God flows together very eloquently. The Old Testament is truly the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is truly the Old Testament revealed. He will expose these things to you if you begin to look at them. So yes, Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30, the Lord does say through His command, He says, all of the tithe is the Lord's of everything. You know what? When I first started tithing, I was trying, I was really, I, I was trying to be picky about it, you know, and like if I would, if I would sell something, you know, if I sold a gun or if I sold a, a truck or, you know, I mean, I never sold houses, but I mean, those are some large numbers, but anything that I would sell, this is, this is fruit, it's it's income. It's it's coming into my my pocketbook, and so I would be like, well, wait a minute, God already had that, that that already belonged to me. Now, listen, this is between you and the Lord, but I'm just telling you the way that I look at it, and and, and I believe that I'm lining up with Scripture in this is that it all belongs to Him. Period. So if I sell my house, I'm going to tithe off of the income that I receive from that house. And, and I know I know I know many people that have that do that and have done that, and and that's that, that's income. Well, the job that I used to work in construction, I tithed off of that. Guess what? I work for the Lord now. I tithe off of what I get paid to preach because that is my income. That's the way that I put food on my table. I'm not a farmer, so I don't raise chickens. Otherwise, I would take 10% of my eggs, which are extremely valuable today. Right now. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, we, we try to compartmentalize these things, and people say, well, you know, tithing is the law. Well, I want to I encourage you with this. Turn to Genesis chapter 14. 
In Genesis chapter 14, beginning in verse 18. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. Okay, well, uh, that's verse 20. Verse 18 and verse 19 is when Abram and Melchizedek, anybody ever heard the name Melchizedek in Scripture? Yes. Okay, Melchiz Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a picture of Christ in the Old Testament, okay? Melchizedek was a king priest or a priest king. Jesus is the king of kings and he is the priest of priests. Amen? And so Melchizedek in the Old Testament is the king of Salem, and he's also the priest of the God Most High. And so Melchizedek brings in the, the bread and the wine. This is a picture of what we do in the New Testament. In other words, this is the, 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 the bread and the, the drink that we partake. Remember, he says, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me, because this is a picture of the brokenness of my body and the blood blood that I'm pouring out, right? Well, we see this in Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, it says that Abram, in, in verse 20, it says that Abram, it says, and blessed be the God most high who has delivered your enemies in your hand. And he, the word he there is Abram. This is Abraham, father Abraham. Abram gave him, him is Melchizedek, the priest of God. The man of God gave him a tithe. Okay, so a lot of people would say, well, they were giving it specifically to him. No, he was bringing it into the storehouse. Now, we don't know that because we don't have Malachi chapter 3 yet. But do you know that Genesis chapter 14, this scripture that you're looking at on the screen right now, was over 500 years before the law was written. Well, that just blows the it's under the law theory out the window because tithing was not under the law. Even though it is in the law, it came over 500 years before the law. And it came through Abram, which if you remember in the very next chapter, God says, you are a righteous man. If we want to walk in righteousness. Then we need to start thinking in alignment with God's Word. So over 500 years before the law, Abram brings a tithe, a tenth of everything, of all everything, into the storehouse of God. So now, now that we understand that tithing is not something that is law, but it's something that actually is something that honors God and gives God an opportunity to bless. Why do you think that, that Abraham was so fruitful and that so he was so blessed? Because he put God first. He put God first. So let's go to Ma uh, Malachi chapter 3 and let's take a look at this. So we understand that this is not, I understand. Okay, so let me, let me go ahead and throw this out there. I understand there are ministries out there that push this to achieve agendas in their own ministries. Right. I get it. Yeah. But let me tell you something, all preachers are not the same. Amen. All preachers are not the same. All ministries are not the same. I'm not here to push an agenda. I'm here so that you can have the information that you need to walk in a blessed life. Period. I walk in a blessed life, and I want you to walk in a blessed life. That's as simple as it is. So let's take a look at this. In Malachi chapter 3, Beginning in verse 6, he says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Let me, let me put that into modern terms. He didn't kill nobody. He said, I ain't going to kill you. Yet, from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from my ordinances. The word ordinances there is, is it's like, um, um, oh gosh, I, I had it wrote down on my notes and I don't have it here. Huh? It, it's like a decree. It's a principles. It's like a principle. It's a, it's a standard. 
I know that probably every one of us have certain standards in our life that we are refusing to waver from, right? Principles that we refuse to waver from. And God is saying, but you have wavered away from these principles, these standards in, that your fathers laid out before you. And he says, you have not kept them. He's saying, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now listen, this is God talking here. This is God kind of having a conversation with himself and answering his own questions. Because you know what? Listen, when we don't do what we are supposed to do, mm -hmm. we don't talk about it, do we? <laughs> We keep our mouth. Listen, when I was in school and I didn't study for a test, I didn't say, oh, I didn't study. I just kept my mouth shut. I didn't say nothing. And so that's what they ain't saying nothing. And so the Lord is having to answer his own questions. He's saying, but you said, in what way shall we return? How are we away from you, God? I let you have control of my decision-making process. I let you have control of my children. But there's some areas in my life I don't want you to have full control of. I want to have control. See, that, that really kind of begs the question is, is who truly is your God? Who's truly your God? Is Visa your God? MasterCard, your God? Paying your mortgage, your God? Uh, listen, I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, I, I pay for all those things too. Water, electricity, all of them. But I honor God first. And listen, you don't have to walk like me. I'm not telling anybody you got to do what I do. I'm telling you I'm doing what the Word of God says. And, and that's the way I lead. I lead my family that way. I lead this ministry that way, is that I honor God first. I cannot expect anyone else to do what I am not willing to do myself. So he says here, he says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Are we robbing him of money? No. He doesn't need our money. Does money pay for the light bill in this building? Does money pay for anything and everything that you see around here? Does money buy the food that we give away once a month on Saturdays? Money buys all those things. How much more could we do if everyone was following this principle. You know what? It's not the government's job to be the social system and to pay people's bills and to give out all kinds of what the government calls as free stuff. It's not free. Nothing is free. But it is the job of the church, and the church cannot do her job because everyone will not honor God's principles. I said it. It's okay. Again, I don't know who all does and does not. I know I do, and that's it, period. I know I do. It's none of my business if you do or you don't. If there's, if there's not enough money to pay my salary, then that means I go get a job, and then guess what? The house of God suffers because I have to now dedicate more time to something else instead of what God has called me to. That, that's all it is. And I'm not here to condemn anybody or to speak anything on anybody, but we, we need to understand this principle. He says, will a man rob God? And he said, yes, you've robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithes and in offerings. These are two different things. The tithe is a tenth, and an offering is a seed. Yeah. It is a free will seed. You put seeds in the ground, you deposit seeds in the ground so that they'll grow, and so that they'll produce. And so, here he says, he says, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. Listen to me. God is not out to curse anyone. No. We bring a curse upon ourselves. Is it, what do you mean by a curse? You mean I'm going to shrivel up and die and look like a mummy? No, he's saying that your finances are going to be poured into a pot that have no bottom in it. They're going to constantly go away. I tell this story all the time. It's kind of like having a, your pocket 
open at the bottom and everything you put in that pocket, it runs out and it falls to the ground. And when you honor God, that it sews up that pocket so nothing can fall out of it anymore. That's just an easy way for me to, to comprehend that. He says, he says, you're cursed with a curse for you have robbed even this whole nation. So you're not just, he's saying, you're not just bringing this upon yourself. You're robbing the entire nation of the blessings that could be poured out upon the nation. Amen. Think about what New Covenant could do and any other church in the area. Calvary. Uh, any, any of the other, there's a new ministry right over on Jade Avenue. I, any of these ministries that are in our area, think about what these ministries could do if everyone followed this principle. We wouldn't need the government. We wouldn't need them to send us a check every month or every whenever, however often it is. But he says, you're cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He says, bring all the tithes into my storehouse. The church is your storehouse that there may be food in my house. What is, what is food to us? It's, it's not a filet mignon. It's not, it's not Cheerios. It's not donuts. Food is the Word of God. The Word of God is the food that we consume. So he's saying, honor me. Bring that into the storehouse so that there's enough food. Let me ask you this. When you go to a restaurant and you order some food, do you just walk out and not pay the bill? I know you do. <laughs> No, that, that's, that's thievery. That's stealing, isn't it? Yes. If you go to a restaurant and you eat that meal, and it's a good meal, and then you just get up and you walk out and you don't pay the bill, you have just stolen from that establishment. Right. Churches are full of people that steal from God every day. Come on, brother. Because I'm telling you, I provide a good meal in this house. I'm laying out a good meal to you. And there are many people that walk out of the house of God every week, week in and week out, refusing to pay the tab. Y'all take that however you want to take it. I know it's offensive, but that's okay. I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> So he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says, now I want you to try me. I want you to put me into the fire and test me and see if I will not promise you what I have told you. He says, try me. Now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, Amen. that there will not be room enough to receive it. Amen. Is he wanting to, to pour out millions of dollars upon you so that you'll be wealthy and you can drive brand new cars and buy fine houses and all these kind of different things that are materialistic items that take the place of God in your life? Amen. Am I saying you shouldn't have a new house? No. Are you, am I saying you shouldn't have a new car? No. Am I saying you shouldn't have all kinds of toys and electronics and all these wonderful things that people want in their life? No, I'm not saying any of that because I have a nice house. It ain't a brand new house, but it's a nice house. I have cars. Our cars are paid for. We're debt. We're, there, is no, there is no car note on our car or, or on my truck because I paid them off. Because you know what? You got to learn to be satisfied with what you've got in order to get to the next place. We've got to learn to be content. You see, this is part of stewardship. Stewardship is putting God first. Stewardship is being content with where you are. There's some other things. I'm, I'm going to mention that in just a minute. But what we're doing, it, we're not robbing God money. You know, some people say, well, why has it got to be 10%? Well, it's an even number for one thing. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not God, and I'm not trying to rationalize it. I'm not trying to think of why God came up with 10. But 10 really, it goes with any number. It doesn't matter. When I made, when I made, uh, when I made $200 a week, my tithe was 20. When I made 200000 a year, my tithe was 20000 for the year. 
So it doesn't matter if you make five dollars, if you make ten dollars, if you make ten thousand dollars, if you make a hundred, if you make one million, it doesn't matter. It's proportionate to your income. We complain about it. We complain about 10% with God, but yet He gave everything. He bankrupted all of heaven and gave His Son, but we want to complain about following God's principles. This is the mindset of people in our world today. So He tells us, he tells us, I, I'm not trying to take from you. I'm not trying to make your life hard, but I want to bless you. And what God blesses, God multiplies. Yes. I want you to know this today as I, as I start bringing this into closure. Gosh, I'm so early today. <laughs> but as I bring this into closure, I want you to understand that what God blesses, He multiplies. And if we will trust Him with what, what we have, He will multiply it. Turn, and I'll give you the example in, in Luke chapter 9. This is the, this is the story of, of feeding the 5,000. And as you're turning in Luke chapter 9, I want you to think of this statement here, or this question. Do you think that God can do more with what's left over? Or I'm sorry. Do you think that you can do more with what's left over than what God can do with all you have? Because that's the mentality of a lot of folks. And listen, that was my mentality. That was my mentality. 20, 25 plus years ago, that was my mentality. This is mine. I can do much more with it, but I didn't, and I couldn't. I failed at it every time. But when I started honoring God and started trusting God with all of it, He began to bless it. I'm not saying that when you begin to honor God that He's going to make you a millionaire. That's not what I'm saying. That's the mentality of a lot of people. Well, if, if, I, if I give God... X number of dollars, then, then it's going to turn into X number of dollars. That's where the seed comes in, the offering. The offering is a seed. When you plant a seed in the ground, you expect it to grow, right? No, no farmer puts a seed in the ground and says, well, I'll never see that again. That's the mentality of a lot of people. They'll, they'll give into an offering plate. That's why we don't pass an offering plate. It's no one's business what you're doing. Doing. That's why we've got the boxes uh, hanging on the back wall there. That's why we've got the mobile means. We've got means where people can go online, go through the text to give, and they can give w without anybody knowing other than the treasurer knowing who it is. That's it. But people have this mentality, well, you know, it's the last time I'll ever see that. I ain't, ain't going to get that back. If that's the heart, if that's the mindset, he says you're giving grudgingly or out of necessity or out of need. There's no blessing in that. There's no blessing on that. But he says when you give a cheer, with a cheerful heart, it's totally different. So let me ask you this before I go into the final scripture. If, if what you have... Let me say this, if what you have isn't blessed, then it will never be enough. People, people have the mindset, I can't afford to tithe. There's two, there's two different types of people in the church, two. There's tithers and there's non-tithers. Now, we could say that for all sorts of different subjects, you know, people that love, people that hate, whatever. We can say that for all sorts of different things. But listen, you ask these two people the same question about tithing. The tither is going to always tell you how blessed they are, how God is faithful, how God honors His Word, how God honors what you do. That's what the tither always says in, in so many words. The non-tither always has the same answer. I can't afford. I can't afford to do it. I can't afford it. And, and, and that's, that's the mindset that Tina and I had for a lot of years. I can't afford it. I can't afford to do it. You know why I couldn't afford to do it? Because cigarettes were more important. You know why I couldn't afford to tithe? Because uh, at that time, 
it was uh, Coors Light if I had enough money. And if it wasn't enough money, then it went to Milwaukee's Best. And if I was really hurting bad, it was Milwaukee's Best Light. <laughs> Because that stuff was usually on sale $9.99 for like a case or a 30 pack. <laughs> That's back in the old days, y'all. <laughs> Way back. But but the thing is, is if if what you have isn't blessed then it'll never be enough. And that's the principle that we see here in, in the feeding of the 5,000. When, when we look at what we have and we compare it to what we need, it's never going to be enough. But when we put it in the hands of Jesus, just as we see in Luke chapter 9, and Jesus has been preaching all day long. And it's starting to get towards the end of the day. And the disciples, I'm sure that they were debating on whether or not they should say anything. Because, I mean, he was preaching. He was preaching good. And one of the disciples had to interrupt him and say, Hey, Jesus, you know, listen, everybody needs to go. They, you need to send everybody away, Jesus, because it's getting late and Chick-fil-A is about to close. And, and, and we don't have food for them. And Jesus, oh, yeah, I love Jesus. I love the way Jesus responds. He said, y'all feed them. Y'all feed them. And they're like, Jesus, all we got is five loaves and two fish. How am I supposed to feed? There's over five. You know what that number 5,000, and I know y'all have heard this before, but in Jewish culture, they only counted the men. The, you, know, you know what that number represents is families. I know the scripture says 5,000 men, but that's how they that's how they they put everything in ranking. What that represented was 5,000 families is what that represented. And the average number, the average family household at that time was four over the whole. So you know what that number? That is as many as 20,000 people listening to Jesus preach. It could be even higher because I'm sure there were some that were like rabbits and they had five, seven, nine kids. I mean, there wasn't no television back in them days. Wasn't no cell phones to entertain the kids. So, I mean, but, but look here. Look at what Jesus, Jesus says, all right, look, guys. Look, guys. And they say, we have no more them five loaves and two fishes and unless we go and buy food for all these people I mean it's just no way Jesus isn't, isn't that our mentality there's no way there's no way it's not going to happen Jesus said make them sit down in groups of 50 and so they did they sat down in groups of 50 and I'm sure that the, probably the disciples were like what is he doing these people need to go it's fixing to be a riot on around here Chick-fil-A is about to close. The kids are getting cranky. I'm getting cranky. But he says here in verse 16, it says that he took the five loaves and he took the two fishes and he looked up to heaven. And I could just see Jesus holding this stuff and saying, Father, now, now it doesn't say, I'm going to ad lib a little bit. Is that okay? Can I stretch a little bit? Because it says that he blessed it and then he broke it and it ga he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitudes. So I could just see Jesus holding up these five loaves and two fishes and saying, Father, we need you to turn this into tuna fish sandwiches. Stretch this out. Now, I mean, Jesus probably didn't say it like that. That's what the disciples were saying. And sometimes that's what we say. <laughs> you know, when we bring one pack of bologna and there's 40 people and we say, Lord, have mercy. Fishes and loaves. And there's always enough. But I just see Jesus holding this bread and these fishes up and saying, Father, thank you. Because this is all that is here. We, we're bringing everything to you. It's Everything is right here. God, we, we ask you to bless this. In other words, put your blessing on the whole amount so that there will be room enough 
for everybody. He said, Father, bless it. And then he, he broke it and he handed it to the disciples. And isn't it amazing that when you put everything in his hands and he's allowed to bless it, that there's always enough. Because it's multiplied in his hands. Number has nothing to do with it. An amount has nothing to do with it. But when you're willing to put everything in his hands and say, I need your blessing on it, because I know that you can do far more with what I give you, all of it, instead of what I'm trying to work with when it's left over. I'll leave you with these three principles about stewardship, and I'll close. This is learning to trust God. A true steward is going to put God first. Now listen, this doesn't just apply in our finances. This is in every area of our life. Every area of our life. Put God first. That's number one. Put God first. Number two is learn to wait. Learn to wait. That's not easy. And that's not easy to teach a child. But this is a principle that works. Learn to wait. Put God first. Learn to wait. And live below your means. When you put God first, God will not fail you. God will not fail you. He promises that. He promises that in your word. He, he says in his word that he wants to bless us. But we've got to be, we have to be willing to allow him to do so. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Father, I give you praise for your word. I thank you, Lord God, for, for what you're speaking through this message. Lord, I, I know that any, I know that any teacher of your word Anytime this subject comes up, it's intimidating because you are really getting into the core of our lives when we start pointing out what's most important to us. Father, I pray that you break down those barriers in our lives today. And Lord, I, I know that any word that I say cannot sway an individual in any direction. I just know what I have allowed myself to surrender to. And that is your direction. And that is you setting your blessing on my life because I truly am giving out 100% to you. I'm saying, God, I trust you 100%. I trust you with not only my finances, but I trust you with my life. I trust you with my marriage. I trust you, Father, with my day. I trust you with my children. I trust you with my confidence. I trust you, Father, in every area. That's truly making you the Lord of my life. I'm giving you full and total control of everything. So, Father, I give you praise for your word because I know your word is powerful. I know your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I know, Lord God, that your word will not return to you void because you promised it in your word.